scripture reading this morning is from the book of Matthew, chapter 6, starting in verse 25, continuing through verse 34. From Matthew, we read, Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more important than food, and the body more important than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow, or reap, or store away in barns, and yet your Heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Who of you, by worrying, can add a single hour to his life? And why do you worry about clothes? See how the lilies of the field grow? They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon, in all his splendor, was dressed like one of these. Is that, if that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown in the fire, will he not much more clothe you, O oh, you, you of little faith? So do not worry, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. I recently saw a funny meme on the internet, and considering the 50th anniversary of the moon landing, which was just a couple weeks ago, I thought I would share it. On the left, you have an astronaut who went to the moon and took five pictures. Then on the right, you have a teenager who went to the bathroom and took 37 photos. <laughs> that kind of... It's funny because it's true, all right? Teens today can take so many pictures, as many as they want. They can see them instantly. Of course, it wasn't like that back in my day, you know, where if you took pictures, you never got to see them until you developed them, which would take a week usually to get, to get them back, or if you went to the one-hour Photoshop, that would cost you an arm and a leg. Nowadays, though, teens can take as many pictures as they want, and they can see them instantly, but of course, at, you can consider the hundreds of thousands of pictures teens take each year, there's still one picture, I think, even today, especially, this is even more true, especially in my day and your day, there was one picture that was most important for the whole year, and it was your school yearbook picture. Because that picture was going to last forever, all right? And so you can imagine the horror, the agony, the teenager, especially a female teenager, might have if a few days before or the day of they woke up and saw this on their face, a big old zit. A greater horror one cannot imagine. Now, of course, today, through the art of digital photography, you can get that thing wiped off. You can remove that, but back in our day, if it was there, it was there, and it was going in the yearbook, and it would be there forever. No wonder a teen couldn't sleep at night. No wonder they couldn't concentrate in class. No wonder he or she was irritable at home, in the classroom, and at practice. That's hanging over you, man, I'm feeling it too. Now, before we laugh off the anxiety and worry of our pubescent teenager, perhaps we should show a little more sympathy and compassion to him or her. For the experience of worry and anxiety, are the same for us as it is for them. The only difference is the what. The object, the person, the circumstances of our anxiety. For us adults, a lot of times that looks like pressures at work. There could be financial difficulties and debt at home. It could be deteriorating family relationships. It could be your health or the health of a loved one. But whatever it is, the experience of anxiety is roughly the same. The American Psychological Association, APA, defines anxiety as an emotion characterized by feelings of tension, worried thoughts, physical changes like increased blood pressure and nausea. It's an intense, excessive, persistent worry and fear about everyday situations, which can result in fast heart rates, rapid breathing, sweating, causing restlessness, and that constant on-edge feeling. That's anxiety. Anxiety is no fun. 
anxiety is a way of robbing all the joy today as well as the hope for tomorrow. And here in the middle of the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus addresses anxiety. In fact, he devotes a surprisingly large amount of words to this one subject. More words than loving your neighbors. More words than on murder, or divorce, or adultery, or giving to the needy. More words than even the Beatitudes. So obviously, Jesus thought this was an important thing to preach on, and an important thing that his audience and us as well need to hear. So what did Jesus say? Well, three times in our passage, Jesus, the master teacher, gives us his intuitive intuition, his otherworldly wisdom. And if you're ready for it, and if you're one taking notes, you know, get ready. It's, I want to make sure you don't miss it. There's three words. I'm going to say it slowly. This is what Jesus said. Do not worry. Do not worry. Verse 25 says, do not worry. Verse 31 says, do not worry. Verse 34 says, do not worry. And us English speakers, if three words is too much, we'll contract it into two. Don't worry. Don't worry. Now, for all of us feeling the weight of worry and anxiety, we collectively say back to Jesus, Jesus, gee, thanks. That's real helpful. Just don't worry. Okay, I just, I'll just stop worrying. It's almost as if Jesus is thinking that we kind of like to worry. And we should just stop doing that thing that we want to do. But of course, the reality is that we don't like it. And oftentimes, we feel helpless to control our feelings of anxiety and worry. And I think it's that last part, that feeling of helplessness, that Jesus is probably most specifically talking to here in the Sermon on the Mount. Yes, of course, some of us may be more naturally prone to worry and anxiety. But that doesn't mean that you are utterly helpless. Because if we were, if we were utterly helpless, and nothing we can do about our worry and anxiety, then what's the point of Jesus teaching on it? What good is it for Jesus to issue the command to not worry if it's completely out of our control? It would be pointless. And thankfully, Jesus does more than just issue this three-word command, do not work. He gives us reasons why we should not work. And by doing this, he shows us what we should do, what to do with our worry, how we can overcome our persistent anxiety. So let's look at the two things we must do to overcome our anxiety based on this passage. First, we must adjust our view of God. That's the first thing. Jesus is going to call us to adjust our view of God. And secondly, when we do that, almost simultaneously, we also adjust our view of our anxiety. So adjusting our view of God and adjusting our view of our anxiety will be how we overcome worry. And so let's begin the first one, adjusting our view of God. Now if we go back to the beginning of the passage, uh, where Jesus gives the command to not worry, he says this, starting in verse 25, he says, uh, hold on. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more important than food, and the body more important than clothes? And then immediately follows the command up with two illustrations. The first, in verse 26, he says this, Look at the birds of the air. They don't sow, they don't reap, they don't store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Likewise, it gives a similar illustration in verse 28. It says, And why do you worry about clothes? Look at the lilies of the field, how they grow. They don't labor, they don't spin. Yet I tell you, not even Solomon, the richest man that ever lived, in all his splendor was dressed, he was not dressed like one of these. If that's how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and gone tomorrow, and is thrown into the fire, Will he not much more clothe you, O oh, you of little faith? So what do we learn from these two illustrations? What's Jesus teaching us? Well, Jesus is making a lesser to greater argument. Lesser to greater argument. He's saying if God feeds birds, which are not created in his image, which he's not seeking a relationship with, which cannot think or communicate or act, 
to the extent that we can, if God still loves and feeds them, then how much more, how much greater does he love us? How much more can we trust that he'll feed us because we are much more valuable than birds? Likewise, Jesus says that if God clothes the lilies of the field with beauty and splendor, flowers which are so transient, here today and gone tomorrow, will he not much more clothe and take care of us? We who live a lot longer than lilies, who have eternal souls, this again is a classic lesser to greater argument. If God cares for birds and for flowers, which are not as important to him, which are not as valuable to him as you and I, will he not much more take care of you? And Ultimately, what Jesus is saying to us is that our anxiety is a sign, it's a pointer, it's a check engine light that our view of God has diminished. That we have shrunk God down, as it were. And we know this by how, God, how Jesus reprimands his listeners and us with these next words, repeating verse 30. He said, If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown in the fire, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? So do not worry, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things. Jesus makes it clear that this sort of thinking, this behavior, is that makes sense for the pagans, for those who do not know the God of Israel. Yes, they should be worried. They don't know God. They should be worried. They don't know if their gods are going to provide for them. They don't know if their gods even care or know what's going on with them. So, yes, they should be worried. But for those who know God, for the Christians, who knows the love of God for him, knows the ability of God, knows the wisdom of God, this sort of anxiety is unthinkable and shows a lack of faith and trust in God. In particular, it shows a lack of faith in at least one of, if not all three, of these attributes of God. His knowledge, his ability, and his love. Now, perhaps we worry and are anxious because we don't know if God really knows about our situation, about our problems. And that's the first of the three attributes, God's knowledge. But Jesus says in verse 32, it says, So do not worry, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows what you need. He knows that you need them. If he knows about birds and lilies and what they need, he certainly knows about what you are going through, and he knows what you need. The problem is not in his knowledge. God is not far off. He's not distracted. He's not on vacation. He knows everything, including all of your needs. Well, if it's not his knowledge, then perhaps it's his ability that's causing us to worry and feel anxious. We believe that God knows, but can he really do anything about it? Uh, my situation. Again, from the illustrations that Jesus gives, it says that God can feed, God does feed the birds of the world. All the birds. Well, that got me thinking, huh, I wonder how many birds there are in the world. And so I did. I went to, to my research assistant named Google, and I typed in, how many birds are there in the world? And according to ornithologist and biodiversity scientist Anna Prosinski, uh, Polish, Polish scientist, so we can trust what she has to say, right? There are between 200 and 400 billion, with a B, billion individual birds in the world. This is just a poster of each individual species of birds only in North America. So if God can provide food for 200 to 400 billion birds, he can certainly provide for his people today. Bernie, I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> but be quiet. You know, right? you know, you know. Yeah. Yeah. No, no, no. There's a big spread between 200 and 400 billion. That's a long way. Well, let's go with the lower than 200 billion. That's still a lot of birds. That's a lot of food. That is a lot of food, exactly. The argument holds, Bernie. <laughs> <laughs> hey, 
Amen. Hey, thank you. Come on the internet and roll home with me. All right. Well, if it's not God's knowledge, if it's not God's ability, if he doesn't lack there, then we are, of course, left questioning God's love. God's, if God knows and God is able, then maybe God just doesn't want to. Maybe he just doesn't care about what's going on with me. Perhaps the source of our worry and anxiety is all been traced back to our inability to believe that God really does love me. Again, back to Jesus' illustration, he says in verse 26, he says, Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Are you not much more valuable than they? And that is the question. Are you more valuable to God than a bird? And for some of you, you kind of actually do struggle with that question. Because birds are nice, for the most part, right? But you know sometimes you're not so nice. So you wonder, does God actually love me? Does he really value me? And you know, oh yeah, Pastor Lucas comes and asks me, do you know God loves you? You know the answer is say yes, of course, but deep down there is some doubt. We're not sure. We're not 100% sure. We think of how often we screw up, how often we doubt or question God, how often we let ourselves down and we wonder how God really could love me, how God really could value me. Perhaps we're getting what we deserve. Perhaps this is divine karma for our sins. God is not going to give me what I want and need because of my sin. And here we get to the root of our worries. The root of our anxiety is ultimately not believing the gospel. The gospel, the good news of Jesus, is that when we, you and I, all humanity, when we were sinners, when we were messed up rebels, when we were focused on ourselves and on our worlds, when we were separated from God, we are told that that is when God did something about our situation. In Romans 5.8, we read, But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, that's when Christ died for us. God didn't wait until we got our acts together. Lord knows we've been waiting for Bernie forever, all right? <laughs> and then send Christ to die for us. No, while we were still sinners, that is when Jesus Christ died for us. And this gift of salvation, this giving of his son, Jesus, to die for us, to take away our sins, and to restore us back to himself, God gives that salvation away to you freely. It's not something you earn. God's not waiting for you to, to do a bunch of good things to make up for all your bad things, and then he'll reluctantly give it to you. No, in Ephesians 2 8, we read this. For it is by grace that you have been saved, through faith. And this not from yourself, it is the gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast. It is by grace, not by works. It is by trusting in what God has already done for us freely. That is the truth of the matter. That is the gospel. And yet how often we, even after experiencing God's wonderful free gift of salvation, how often as Christians do we fall back into this mentality that we got to work to keep God's love. Yeah, God did that for us freely, but now i got to work to keep God's love. And if we mess up, God's really going to hold it against me. He's going to keep good things from me. And he's not going to take away this bad stuff that's happening to me or my loved ones. And thus we worry. And thus we feel anxiety. That is the root of worry and anxiety. It is, not, it is doubting the gospel. Doubting that God knows. Doubting that God is able. Doubting that God cares about you. And frankly, that is simply a lie straight from hell itself. Notice again how the lesser to greater argument holds even here. If God loved us before we were Christians, when we were still in our sins, still separated from God, how much more does he love us now that we are united to Christ? Now that we house his Holy Spirit within us? Now that we are his adopted sons and daughters, how much more does he love us even now? 
you don't think God really knows, you don't think God really is able, you don't think God really cares about your situation, then truly you need to adjust your view of God. Because your God is too small, too weak, too limited, and frankly, just too human. The real, true, and living God absolutely knows, absolutely is able, and absolutely cares and loves you. Therefore, the first thing we must do with our worry is to adjust our view of God. Secondly, we must also adjust our, well, when we adjust our view of God, we begin to adjust our view of the anxiety itself. Now, the sad part is that for many of us, when we feel anxious, when we feel worried, we don't connect the dots and realize the spiritual dimensions to our worry and to our anxiety. The spiritual doubts that are behind it. We are often so focused on the problem itself, the person, the situation, the circumstances causing the, the anxiety that we forget about God. Our view of God becomes obstructed by the worry and anxiety. So you have the thing causing you the worry and anxiety which is not fun. And then on top of that, the worry itself is blocking your source of peace and serenity, which is God. This is why Jesus said in verse 33, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Jesus is saying we get so wrapped up in seeking our kingdoms that we lose God's perspective on things. This is why Jesus taught us in the Lord's Prayer, thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And he tells us this because we can get so focused on our kingdom, we can get so focused on our wills. Seeking God will help increase our view of God. It will enlarge our view of God's love and his ability for us. And at the same time, seeking God will deminimize, it will shrink, decrease the size of and the perceived significance of the source of our anxieties and worries as well. It helps us to look at our situation from an eternal perspective as opposed to just a temporal perspective as we seek his kingdom. Now additionally, Jesus gives us two more lines of reasoning to help us see worry for what it really is and what it does. In verse 27, Jesus says, Who of you by worrying can add a single hour to your life? What he's saying here is worry is utterly useless. It literally doesn't do you any good. It doesn't solve your problems. It only makes you feel worse. In fact, the only good thing I could think of that I could say for worry, the only good thing about worry, is that worry can serve, again, as an indicator, as a pointer, as a check engine light, that something is amiss, spiritually speaking. Other than that, worrying is utterly useless. And the second line of reasoning Jesus makes about worry is found in verse 34, where he says, Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough of its own trouble. What Jesus is saying here is that worry only has the ability to make your day worse. It's as if Jesus knows that there's always going to be something to worry about. Each day, you're going to have something to worry about. And if that's the case, don't make it worse by fretting about tomorrow's worries as well. All that does is steal today's joy and tomorrow's hope. And thus, if we adjust our view of our anxiety, see how utterly worthless it is, and how it makes things worse, not better, I think that will help us to desire to seek God rather than seek, dwell on, stew in our worry and in, and in our anxiety. But, before I close, let me say that on the one hand, I don't think what Jesus is talking about here is clinical anxiety. For some people, there is, it is, goes beyond, and they need therapy and some medication. So that's, I don't think that's what Jesus is addressing here, especially to his first century uh, audience. But on the other hand, I also don't think that Jesus is saying that we should never worry or have any anxiety again. And if you do, then you're a bad Christian. No, I think worry and anxiety, and anxiety are common realities that go along with being human and living in a fallen world, which is why Jesus says here in that last verse, therefore do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough of its own. Jesus is saying, yeah, each day it's something to worry about every single day. I understand that. The real priority 
that Jesus is getting at in this section of the Sermon on the Mount. He's saying, what are you going to do with that word? It's good. You're going to have it. You're going to have things to worry and be anxious about. But what are you going to do with it? Are you going to dwell on the worry and anxiety and let it cripple you? Will you complain and worry like the non-Christian, using the same tone and the same words and the same attitude as those who have no idea who God is, what he's really like? Or will you take your worries and anxieties to the Lord? Will you remember that God knows about your worries, he can do something about them, and that God loves you and he actually cares about you? This Tuesday at our evening Bible study, we looked at another pastor that speaks on anxiety and has a lot in common with this one here in Matthew. It gives us a similar answer concerning what we are to do with our anxiety. In Philippians 4, 6 through 7, we read this. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. And that's ultimately what we want when we, have, when we experience work, isn't it? We want God's peace. And if that's what we want, we're told here how to get it. It says, in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. Or as they said in the study, I love how they put it, it says, the way to be anxious about nothing is to be prayerful about everything. The way to be anxious about nothing is to be prayerful about everything. When we pray, we are acknowledging that God knows about our worry. We are acknowledging that God has the ability to do something about our worry. And ultimately, we are reminding ourselves of God's love for us. His free, unwavering love that never waxes nor wanes. We are reminding ourselves of the gospel. And when we do that, worry and anxiety do not stand a chance. They are deflated and shrunk from the light of the gospel and replaced with the peace of God that transcends It's above our earthly understanding. It's a peace that's so utterly confusing and perplexing to everyone outside of Christ that your non-Christian neighbor will look at you and say, how can they have peace given their circumstances? Why are they not more worried and fearful? The answer is because of the power of the gospel that can and will cast out fear and worry and anxiety and in its place fill you with peace and comfort and confidence that God knows, God is able, and that God loves you. Let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father, you could be said of us, you could be speaking right to us many times, O ye of little faith, how often do we forget how knowledgeable you are. You know everything. You're on your omniscient. How often do we forget that you are able, that you are omnipotent, there's nothing you cannot do. Father, forgive us how often we doubt and forget how much you love us. That should be seen every time that we look to the cross. We remember, this is how much you love us. While we were still sinners, this is how much you loved us. And now, Father, as we come to the communion table, we come to eat and drink, and to be reminded once again of your great love, your great knowledge, and your great ability to take care of us. And let us not forget, you have taken care of the thing that is the most central, most important thing for our lives. And that is, you, did, you have solved the problem of sin and our separation from you. There is nothing more important than that. And so all the other worries and anxieties we face, Father, they, this too shall pass. And we can have, still have joy and confidence because the greatest thing has been taken care of. And for that we give thanks and we remember now as we come to your table. May we come joyfully, thoughtfully, and thankfully in Jesus' name.